Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Kramsurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Today we're having a look at another paper uh, concerning appendicitis and particularly the risk of conversion to um, open surgery and outcomes in uh, cohorts of patients that undergo um, surgery converted to open. We'll have a slightly shorter episode today. Uh, there will be no formal teaching, but we'll uh, compensate with a good discussion about the paper. I'll leave you to it. Okay, thank you. So I'll just uh, formally introduce myself. My name is Daniel Senti. I'm one of the uh, core surgical trainees in Kinderfields Hospital. And uh, today we'll be looking into um, a, a paper published in July in the World uh, Journal of Surgery. Uh, the title is Conversion from Laparoscopic to Open Appendectomy. It's looking into trends, risk factors, and outcomes. It's a 15-year-old, 15-year uh, single-center analysis of 2,193 adult patients. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, the background of appendicectomy? Yeah. yeah, just a few historical notes more than anything else. I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, what we do with acute appendicitis nowadays. Um, the first um, appendicectomy was described quite some time ago now in 1735 by Amiant, um, concomitantly with the repair of, um, of a groin hernia. Uh, it's an interesting story. If you want to hear about it, we can talk about it later. Um, the first full description of laparoscopic appendicectomy dates back to 1983, so now quite a few years. Um, and not long after that, in 1992, um, the first hybrid technique called TULA or transumbilical laparoscopic assisted appendicectomy uh, was described as well. Um, this latter technique remains quite popular, especially in kids, especially in the continent, uh, Italy and France and, uh, and Germany. Um, we can talk about it later if, if any of you is interested. Um, the chart at the bottom is more kind of a a reminder of how the trend from 1999 to 2007 and beyond up to today uh, has been with, characterized by a significant shift from open surgery to laparoscopic surgery, which applies to appendicectomy um, as well. Uh, I'd say that nowadays 95 to 99 percent of appendicectomies are started and completed laparoscopically. Um, so in this context, uh, the authors are looking at uh, predominantly um, people that um, undergo a laparoscopic appendicectomy, but for a variety of reasons end up with a conversion to open and look at their outcomes. Uh, I'll uh, pass the ball back to Daniel for a bit more about uh, the aims of this paper. Well, thank you, Gio. So what we are looking um, for uh, with this study is to determine the outcomes of the patients that underwent uh, initially um, laparoscopic approach, but they had uh, conversion to an open surgery and identify risk factors for this conversion. Now, this uh, being a retrospective study, we can't really use a PICO layout. However, with this caveat, if we were to uh, talk about PICO, the population um, that the study is, um, is aimed for is adult patients over 14 years old uh, that were diagnosed with acute appendicitis, and we will see how these were diagnosed and how they categorized appendicitis. The intervention we are interested in is conversion to open appendicectomy, and we're comparing this with the fully laparoscopic approach, and also um, the outcome, which will be post-operative recovery time and the morbidity. Uh, Gio, what methods uh, were used in the study? Um, so um, this is a retrospective study, a retrospective cohort study to be more accurate. Um, that uh, enrolled patients uh, were operated on between 2006 and 2020 in a single center, uh, a tertiary um, center with a, a significant historical tradition with laparoscopy uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Um, it includes all patients that were diagnosed with um, appendicitis uh, and underwent a laparoscopic appendicectomy. The diagnosis was clinical 
and the author described this as being supported by abdominal ultrasound or CT in all cases. Um, they don't specify what supported actually means and how many of those cases were actually CT or ultrasound proven. Um, they um, define complicated appendicitis as appendicitis um, associated with a perforation, gangrene, empyema, um, abscess or peritonitis. Um, identified obviously at laparoscopy. Uh, well, back to Danny for a bit more about the methods. Um, thank you. So um, as Dio said, only the laparoscopic operations were considered in this uh, study. So if there were any open operations, primarily they were not included. And the surgical technique was standardized. So um, the time for surgery was standardized as well. All the patients that were diagnosed uh, with the help of uh, ultrasound and CT along with the clinical suspicion, they were operated on within 12 hours of the diagnosis and they operated on all the patients with appendicitis. All these operations were performed by a surgical resident uh, with some level of senior supervision, which is not really specified, but we'll get into that as well. Uh, the data they have analyzed included the uh, age, gender, uh, body mass index of the patients, uh, how fit they were at ASA score, their comorbidities, um, if they had any operations previously, the grade of appendicitis, uh, time of operation, complications uh, during operation, length of stay, and if they needed to come back later. Uh, could you walk us through the results, please, uh, Gio? Yeah, let's start uh, <clears throat> having a look at the results. So as the title of the paper hints at, uh, the patients included were 2,193. The vast majority, um, 2,141, uh, had um, a full laparoscopic appendicectomy and 52, so about 2% were converted to open surgery. Um, the um, normal appendicectomy rate was about 5%, which depending on how you see uh, and interpret their uh, inclusion criteria could be high or could be low. Uh, we don't know how many of those patients actually had imaging proven appendicitis. If all of them did, 5% is probably quite high. Uh, if obviously not, and I assume that it is the case, 5% uh, is probably, probably reasonably good. Um, and as you can see, um, there are quite a few significant differences between the two cohorts of patients. So the patients that are the full laparoscopic appendicectomy, the patients that undergo a conversion. Uh, obesity uh, particularly um, is much more common. Uh, previous abdominal operations, complicated appendicitis and peritonitis. And all these three factors are statistically significantly associated on multivariate analysis with an increased risk of uh, conversion to open surgery. Uh, operative time is a bit longer uh, if you end up converting uh, and interoperative and postoperative morbidity um, are uh, higher overall in the converted group and we'll go into some more details about that later. Ball back to you Daniel for more results. Now for the more results um, we'll look into why these patients have to be converted. Uh, so as we can see on the first part of this table, the reason for conversion um, of, of appendicectomy was most of the times because the base of the appendix was perforated. So this was present in 28.8%. Uh, the next reason would be adherences of the appendix, um, followed by the base not being recognized and uh, an appendicular flash trauma, which was identified both with 11.5%. Uh, now, other uh, reasons which are not uh, described in the paper made up to 28.8% of, of conversion rates. Uh, and if we look at the interoperative complications, um, the, the open approach had a higher percentage, which is 3.8%, uh, but it's difficult to assess because of the, the low number, the cohort of the patients that underwent um, interoperative which had intraoperative complications, which were two. One of them had bowel injury, and the other one had retroperitoneal hematoma. If we look at the fully laparoscopic approach, um, the most common um, complication was poor side bleeding. 10 of 10% uh, had this, and then uh, bowel injury followed by retroperitoneal hematoma and bladder injury. Um, what were the post-operative outcomes? Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, this graph is actually looking at 
conversion rates during the time. So as Gio said, they started the study in 2016 um, on, on uh, going for 15 years. And we can see the conversion rate actually um, getting lower in time with a, a spike in 2020. Uh, this was speculatively attributed to COVID and with late presentation patients that uh, were probably more <laughs> complex that they needed conversion uh, to, um, to have their appendix removed openly. Um, so what were the post-operative outcomes here? Well, yeah, um, this uh, um, table summarizes most of them. Um, as you can see, um, readmissions were pretty much equally common in um, uh, the conversion cohort and the full laparoscopic cohort. Um, there's a few caveats here and a few things I would like to highlight. Um, in terms of readmissions, uh, 38 of those were due to an interdominal abscess. However, in total, there's 80 cases of reported interdominal abscesses. That means that roughly half of them gets managed on, on an ambulatory basis, which I think is quite um, um, interesting. And um, wound infection, which is kind of the second uh, benchmark I use, at least uh, for myself, to determine the quality of, of um, um, appendix surgery uh, is pretty much in line with what would you would expect for a laparoscopic appendicectomy. So I tend to quote to my patients anywhere between 2 and 5% chance of either an organ space infection or a skin infection. Uh, and these numbers pretty much match. Uh, they are significantly higher in the conversion to open group. Um, the um, organ space abscess frequency um, here is higher probably as a reflection of the fact that those patients had worse appendicitis. Um, but the wound infection rate is probably a reflection of the technique. Uh, well, most certainly is, as you would expect, being the appendix passed through the wound for the wound to be um, to be more likely to get infected as there is no splinting from a, a retrieval bag. And most often a, a wound protector is not used. Um, if we look at the overall complication rate, um, split, split by uh, Clavian Dindo, one to four. As you can see, uh, low low level complications such as Clavian Dindo one and two are much more common in the um, conversion group. However, as we hit Clavian Dindo complications of type four, which are the most severe ones, uh, then the difference doesn't really persist or is not as, as significant. Um, Ball, back to you for uh, some more about limitations. So the limitations that the author uh, reported, um, obviously this being a retrospective study, um, it has the nature of particularly susceptible, being uh, susceptible to the effects of bias. There's quite a, a good number of cases overall. However, it was quite a small number of patients that underwent um, uh, conversion to open appendicectomy. And also the results, as they say, may not be generalizable to other centers. This being a, a center that historically has been vastly trained in laparoscopic surgery, um, it might not be the same in other centers which are uh, less fortunate in this, uh, in this case. Uh, Joe, what, what other limitations did you identify? <laughs> Well, yeah, we never looked through the paper. We thought about a few other things. Um, well, one thing we already highlight is predominantly related to inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, it's very unclear how imaging was um, considered in terms of inclusion exclusion criteria, and we should probably ask the authors uh, a bit of information about that. Um, furthermore, we don't know really um, what was the overall cohort of patients uh, that had appendicitis in that institution and how many first-hand open appendicectomies were performed in time. I suspect you should probably see an inverted type of trend compared to laparoscopic appendicectomies, but you don't know for sure. Um, it's very unclear how the author extracted the data. Um, hard to say whether they went from um, a set of codes for operation notes, whether they had uh, somewhere a maintained date set or whatever, um, and that does raise some questions about the data quality as well, because obviously with this not being a pre-planned cohort study, um, the reporting of certain variables, particularly interoperative, uh, can be 
sometimes difficult to extrapolate. Um, maybe you note that there is pass in the pelvis and pass in the right quadrant. Um, you know, that does potentially count as peritonitis. Would you necessarily write it in your op note once you've done it and you washed it out? Not necessarily. Would that possibly affect the quality of the data here? Probably. Um, the authors um, do say very clearly that they do operate on everybody that they think got appendicitis, whether that's imaging proven or not. Uh, they don't really offer conservative treatment to these patients. So um, the compatibility with the legal framework that we've got here, where we are kind of mandated to talk about conservative treatment, um, is probably not there. Very unclear uh, from the paper um, what grade of surgeons were involved in the operations and what supervision was provided, whether that was um, directly in theatres, remote, um, et cetera, et cetera. There certainly is a learning curve for laparoscopic surgery. I believe every training has experienced that. Uh, and certainly it's hard to say without knowing the level of the surgeons involved and what sort of the background of those surgeons is, um, how that affected the study, particularly in the early phases. Um, I'd say that the attribution of conversion rate, higher conversion rate um, to COVID is certainly a possible explanation, but not necessarily the only one. And finally, a note about how I would have represented the data in time, um, longitudinal data in time, uh, if I had been um, contributing to this paper. And I would have used statistical process control charts um, because um, a statistical process control chart allows you to identify when a particular type of process goes out of control, whether in a positive way or in a negative way. So it would have been easier to probably visualize um, when a laparoscopic appendicectomy actually took off and if in particular time points, um, there were significant changes in the conversion rate, uh, both in positive and in negative. I think the correlation matrix that they designed is certainly helpful, but it, it doesn't allow for that type of visual visualization and, and analysis. Um, Bold to uh, you, Daniel, for some conclusion. So, um, in, in conclusion, uh, what the paper tried to uh, to emphasize on, and what we what was the message that we got is that the adult patients uh, that high have a higher risk of, of conversion rate. So, uh, previous abdominal operation, obesity, complicated appendicitis, or peritonitis, uh, they should be thoroughly advised about the higher risk of conversion. And um, in the table below, we, we summarize what we discussed with the positive and the negative aspects of the study. As usual, a quick summary about the discussion we've had um, after the paper presentation. First of all, we reiterated some points that were made during the presentation, particularly the importance of understanding how many uh, appendicectomies were overall performed uh, during the study period and how many of them were started as open surgery to understand uh, what the overall cohort looks like and what trends look like um, for open surgery itself. Uh, we then discussed the importance of clear inclusion criteria and the importance of imaging as part of the diagnostic process for appendicitis. We reiterated uh, some of the factors that do affect the external validity of this study, particularly application um, to the UK, such as the importance of offering conservative management uh, as part of treatment for appendicitis to uh, patients, as this is mandated by the UK legal framework. A further very important point for discussion uh, relates to the relevance of the findings of this study to the uh, general surgical practice. And overall, um, we did agree on the fact that there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that risk factors identified in this study as associated with conversion to open surgery were already well known uh, beforehand. And finally, um, we touched upon a very important point that applies to the vast majority of retrospective cohort studies, and that has to do with the quality of the data included in the study itself. This relates to both the classification of acute appendicitis and the diagnosis of peritonitis, as this 
is probably being estimated from operation notes and operation notes are intrinsically variable depending on who's writing them. Furthermore, um, we do understand that the um, technique was standardized for um, all acute appendicitis. However, um, there will surely be some technical variations that have not been um, included within this particular description of the laparoscopic appendicectomy technique. Finally, uh, we do have to ask ourselves what was the um, purpose of the initial laparoscopic approach. Um, there's a big difference between an unexpected, unplanned conversion to open surgery and, on the other hand, um, a diagnostic laparoscopy followed by a pre-planned open appendicectomy. And that would obviously skew the results in a significant way. Uh, we'll ask a few questions to the authors and uh, um, we'll let you know. See you next time. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.